Lee Kuan Yew and Robert Kwok are two titans of Southeast Asia. Born just 20 days apart from each other in 1923, both lived through uncertain times. From British colonised Malaya to the brutality of Japanese armed forces in World War II, they navigated this tumultuous period in history to become incredibly influential and respected icons across Asia and the world. From meeting each other for the first time in 1941 at Ruffles College, one went on to build a nation, the other a business empire. As I've been travelling around Japan for the last few months, I wanted to do some research on what these two thought about Japan and its people. Their perspectives, shaped by their unique wartime experiences, offer interesting insights into Japan that go beyond the typical romanticised portrayal of the country often seen in the West. Let's start with Lee Kuan Yew. Like many in his generation, his life was heavily influenced by the events of World War II. He was quoted as saying that the Japanese occupation years were the most important period of his life and that it gave him vivid insights into the behaviour of human beings and human societies, their motivations and impulses. I learnt more from the three and a half years of Japanese occupation than any university could have taught me. In fact, he recounts a few stories during this period, one being how he narrowly escaped execution during Sukjing, a genocidal campaign targeting young men of Chinese descent in Singapore that took the lives of 25 to 50,000 people. About 10 days after the fall, we were told to collect ourselves in certain collection centres. So they said, go there. So I said, I have left my clothes behind. I did not feel good. The gantry points were manned by Japanese soldiers, where they get all the young males together and register them. And some of them will be sent by lorries to be executed in the Sukjing. So I went back and stayed light low for a few days with my gardener. He had a, a laborer's quarters there, so I billeted myself with him. Well, I was lucky. I was lucky. Those who went on that lorry were taken to the beach and shot would have been me. And in this interview, he recounts the brutality he witnessed as a young man, explaining why the Japanese never talk of human rights and his fears on why they could become a fearsome military power again. The first thing I saw, two human heads on a pole outside the tallest building in Singapore and Chinese characters to say, if you are not well behaved, you will end up here. I thought to myself, if only I had a camera, here was this modern 12-storey building, highest in Singapore then, and this medieval scene. So the Japanese never talk of human rights. They understand the brutality, the cruelties that they inflicted on fellow Asians, whom they came to so-called liberate. I'm quite convinced that they can become a very powerful military force. And if cornered again the way, the way they were in 1941 with an oil embargo and no exports, Rather than curl up and die, they'll fight. It's in the nature of the culture of a people. They are not people who are going to lie down, curl up, face the wall. But despite his reservations about Japan, he built closer ties between the two nations as the leader of Singapore, eventually receiving one of Japan's highest honours after his death in 2016. As the ultimate pragmatist, he wanted to maintain relations with industrially advanced Japan to bring in new investments, technology and manufacturing expertise, as Singapore was still a small village by today's standard, with companies like Sumitomo building Southeast Asia's first petrochemical complex in Singapore in 1984. In the early 90s, Lee even encouraged young Singaporeans that they learn Japanese, as he felt that Japan would be a dominant player in the region for decades to come. And as I said, if my Chinese were good enough, I would pick up Japanese, because they are going to be a very important source of technology and finance. They may have be undergoing difficulties at the moment, but I'm absolutely convinced that they are going to be become one of the leading industrial or post-industrial nations in the next 50 years. Maybe longer. But Leders changed his mind after the bubble popped, saying that young Japanese should leave the country if they could speak English, criticising the government's management of his ageing population. But we'll come back to this later. Eventually, Lee's initial fear of the Japanese turned into admiration for their efficient and hard-working culture. In his memoirs, 
He mentions how the Japanese consider themselves a special people with no other nation in Asia coming close to their group solidarity. I've confirmed it with 40 years of touring and throwing with the Japanese. In personal physical toughness, the Koreans can beat the Japanese, but not in group solidarity. As a group, neither the Koreans, nor the Chinese, nor the Vietnamese, they're all East Asians, they're all Confucianists, they can't beat the Japanese. They are like Lego bricks, you know, they fit yeah, into each other. So. Yeah. It's beautiful yeah. and impressive. As an example, Lee mentioned how the Japanese managed natural disasters compared to other countries, saying that after the 1995 Kobe and 2011 Tohoku earthquakes, the Japanese simply came together to rebuild and help each other in a calm and orderly way. He contrasts this to the aftermath of the 1992 Los Angeles earthquake, where there was widespread looting and rioting. Additionally, he also admired their work culture and how they strive for perfection in almost everything they do, whether it be defect-free television, cars, to the putting together of the best tasting sushi. And it's this culture of perfection that still gives Japan a competitive edge today. In this interesting snippet from 1994, Lee was worried that smart women in the workforce in Singapore were unlikely to get married and have children, as men of that time didn't want to marry a woman that was smarter or made more money than them. We forgot that culture does not change rapidly. Your mother implants ideas in you. So you want to be the boss in the family. You don't want a wife who's smarter than you and earning more than you. In the 60s, he pondered the possibility of developing a model similar to Japan, where intelligent women, instead of attending university, would attend finishing schools to become suitable partners for potential husbands. Had we known this, we would have done what the Japanese did. And their economy never suffered. They sent all their smart girls to finishing colleges. The courses are as tough as the universities but they did not pose a challenge to the Japanese male because it's called finishing college. They learn economics, they learn languages, they learn lots of useful things to become good counterparts of their husbands, good hostesses to help the husband's career and to bring up the next generation. So they restricted entry to the university before to 10%. Now they have loosened up to 20%. And they do not face the same problem so severely. So if I could go back to 1959, I would have done the same thing. Gradual opening up and re-education of the male and of mothers. However, in his book, One Man's View of the Bold, published in 2013, he acknowledged that the Japanese system of restricting women to university has not worked at all with Japanese women increasingly choosing not to go down the culturally signed path of being a housewife and having children, with Japanese universities today still restricting women, with institutions like the Tokyo Medical University purposely manipulating candidates' test results to keep female enrollments to 30%. Lee acknowledged that women have found a new taste of freedom, observing that the Japanese women who worked for Singapore Airlines and married a Singaporean air stewards found a certain freedom from the cultural norms back home. In fact, in this article that was published this year, of the 520,000 Japanese living abroad as permanent residents, 62% are women, with many claiming that the gender gap and work-life balance is better overseas. Regardless, Lee predicted a grim future for Japan due to his ageing society, saying that although the middle class will remain comfortable for many years to come, many young people will eventually choose to leave the country as they shoulder the increasing economic burden. Furthermore, in one man's view of the world, he reflects on Japan's refusal to take in immigrants, saying that the Japanese take pride in their racial purity, excluding even overseas-born Japanese, like the time the government tried to attract Japanese Brazilians back to Japan, only to send them back. If you study the figures in Japan, you will find that they refuse to take any migrants because they want to keep Japan pure for the Japanese. Even Japanese racially from Brazil came back to Japan, 700 of them could not speak Japanese and were sent back to Brazil. The net result is a Japan which is stagnant and a Japan that despite several stimulus packages is still in the doldrums.
He criticised Japan's insular nature and intolerance of outsiders, where even young Japanese, who had spent time overseas, have a difficult time adapting when they return, even if they had studied in Japanese schools, saying that so much in everyday communication is left unspoken, with people expected to make inferences based on subtle body languages and vocal cues. Because of their refusal to let go of such rigid ideology, Lee advised the next best thing the country could do was taking immigrants from ethnic groups that look Japanese, like the Chinese, Koreans and Vietnamese at a larger percentage. However, after many decades of observing the country, Lee predicted that Japan is a country that cannot escape becoming a mediocre one. On Japan-US relations, Lee predicted that a diminished Japan has no choice but to remain partners with the US, continue to host their military in Okinawa to counter any potential disputes with China, as they are now dealing with a unified China that stands 10 times its size, not a China they could easily invade like was the case in World War II. The United States together with Japan will be able to balance China. And that's the way you see the future? I think so. The strategic balance between the United States and Japan on one hand and China on Absolutely. the other? Absolutely. I don't think the Japanese would be wise to go it alone, and they know it. I don't think the United States alone can take China and Japan. So if Japan possible. and China, would, which is culturally Im unlikely ever yeah. to happen. If they got together, that's coupled for the rest of Asia. However, if US influence declines in the region, Japan may find itself becoming a client state to China, but will develop a self-defense force with nuclear weapons for deterrence purposes something that Lee believed would not be in the interests of world peace and stability. Furthermore, Lee believed that Japan should have resolved its ambiguity about its role in the last war, especially to his neighbours China and the two Koreas. Despite multiple apologies, he found it hypocritical and unnecessary for Japanese leaders to continue to visit the controversial Yakasuni Shrine, which houses 14 convicted Class A war criminals. But despite tensions over World War II that flare up from time to time, Lee believed that there is no deep-seated animosity between the two nations, highlighting that trade and investments between the two nations continue to grow at a phenomenal rate, and that it is in the best interests of the region that the two keep building stronger ties. Now onto Robert Kwok. Unfortunately, as a media-shy billionaire, there's not much actual video footage I could find, but I'll quickly relay some of his thoughts from his memoirs and an interview he did with the Asahi Shimbun. Born in 1923, a month after Lee Kuan Yew, Robert Kwok is the richest person in Malaysia with a net worth of over $11 billion, and he earned the nickname as the Sugar King of Asia as he made his original fortune from trading sugar and developing sugar refineries, at one time controlling 80% of Malaysia's sugar market. He later expanded his empire and invested in other industries like real estate and hospitality, with many of you familiar with Shangri-La hotels and resorts. Similar to Lee, the experience of living through Japanese occupation left an enormous impact on his life. In fact, he was compelled to give a rare interview with the Asahi Shimbun in 2019, as he felt that many young Japanese were still not being taught about the horrors of what the Japanese did during World War II. In that article, he details the horrific stories on the murders and beatings of friends and classmates committed by the Japanese in the Malayas. And in his memoirs, he details how he resented the Japanese invasion of China so much that he wanted to join the military and fight. He was also critical of what the Japanese considered loyalty, saying, The Japanese have a kind of loyalty, but it's an uncritical, Bushido type of loyalty. They are loyal even if the boss is a skunk. However, amidst the crisis during World War II, one huge opportunity came for Kwok. To avoid being labelled as anti-Japanese by the secret police, he was encouraged to work for a Japanese company, which turned out to be Mitsubishi, one of the largest corporations of its time. And it was this decision that changed his life forever. He was their first employee in Johor Bahru. By age 20, he was tasked with running the rice department, which held a monopoly on the entire rice trade in Malaya. And after the war, taking the lessons he learnt from this time at Mitsubishi, he started his own businesses and established long-term friendships and connections with influential Japanese businessmen, even doing business with Mitsui in the 1950s to start a sugar refinery. The rest is history, and despite his experiences of Japanese brutality during World War II, he states that Japan is still his favourite holiday destination and that they're a nation of honest, hard-working people that were misled by a handful of criminal-minded men, and he hopes that they won't repeat the same mistakes of history.